I think as the introduction said, uh, we were looking to get out of town, not see too many people and maybe find something of interest. So um, this book that I've mentioned before in one of Jonathan's sessions is just two years old and it's the second edition and it, it details the state. I mean, the book is about two inches thick and it takes sections of the state so you can see that in the little picture, this is the north central uh, section. And we spent the day in uh, Concordia, which is a town of about 5,000, right where that blue dot is in um, Cloud County. We actually stayed in Clay Center, which is just a little bit to the east. Um, they detail the cities, what to see in the cities, restaurants, places to stay. Um, as well as what's out in the county, you know, along the rural roads and, and that kind of thing. So next slide. So there is a 140 foot wall that is part of the museum and it's done in the same kind of sculpture that the walls of the Midwest Trust Center are done in. So it's a relief, brick relief. Uh, that gives the history of Concordia. Um, if I didn't say it's a town of about 5,000 people, and the thing it's really noted for is this orphan train complex. Um, there are about 6,400 bricks in this wall. And um, next slide, please. So this... The complex is three buildings and it's now received national attention. Um, between 1854 and 1929, 250,000, 250,000 children were resettled across the country from East Coast uh, cities. And the um, next slide, please. Uh, this railroad old uh, train station is where the big displays are, artifacts, trunks, uh, children's toys. Um, and each of those windows has a, a huge poster with a picture of a child and that child's story. It's really very touching to walk around inside and see um, and hear about the stories. Uh, next slide. Uh, as you can imagine, these children uh, were displaced, you know, by the time they're that old, they're um, kind of set in their personalities. A lot of them had trouble adjusting. And sometimes the farmers just wanted labor and didn't treat them very well. Uh, they were, there were two major societies, a Catholic society and another one formed by some wealthy patrons. Uh, they were checked once a year to see how they were getting along. Some of them were resettled. They went with another family. Uh, I'm sure if you've read any of the books, there are good stories and, and bad stories. Uh, next slide. So this is the research center. Um, they've done an excellent job with the video. In fact, uh, Cloud County Community College students helped them with the video. And there's a research area, gift store, of course. And today there are about 30 of these little statues around the city. And they are sometimes donated by the descendants of the orphans. So it was very interesting to read their stories also all around the town of uh, Concordia. Next slide. Uh, one of the other things that was interesting is that uh, Concordia was hey, the Alex, site. For a second. I'm sorry. The site of a uh, World War II POW camp um, between 1943 and 1945. There were 4,000 German POWs. Uh, it was built on the site of a previous CCC camp. How do you think I'd get my um, picture out of in front of this? There screen? were some 304 buildings. Uh, all that's left now is a guardhouse. And we were a little disappointed. There is a museum, but it doesn't seem it was 
unair conditioned. There was nobody around to tell us anything. Uh, there were some real unsavory neighbors, so we didn't spend a lot of time here, but there is some real history. There were 12 camps in Kansas, and this was the largest of the POW camps in, uh, in Kansas. Uh, next slide. Is there an X in the bottom of that? So uh, before you go on, um, I'm going to mute everybody but Linda uh, because we can hear your background conversation if you're if we're not careful here. So uh, I think everybody's muted now except for Linda. And why don't you go ahead, Linda? Okay. So this is a picture of the POW camp. As I say, the barracks were previously um, a CCC camp. Um, next slide. And this is the only thing that really remains of the camp. The rest of it is uh, agriculture, cornfields, soybean, fi soybean fields, and that's one of the guard towers. Uh, actually, the prisoners really had it pretty good. I mean, they went to work on farms and they were fed reasonably well and uh, that kind of thing. So next slide. Uh, this is the Brown Grand Theater built in about the early, very early 1900s uh, by the Brown family, who was a wealthy family at the time. I think there are about three theaters like this in Kansas. There's one in Hutch, one in Wamego, and uh, this one. Uh, next slide. It, it is gorgeously redone, you know, much like you might think the folly with all the gold leaf and the arch lights and velvet curtains. Um, about a 600 seat theater. Uh, Don and I were quite interested because we ushered um, in Polsky and um, Yardley and we were actually given a tour by the director. She was, we had called and she was there. And so she gave us, uh, gave us the tour. It, Sometimes they refer to these as opera houses. Um, they were everything. They were town meetings. Um, they were burlesque. They were opera. They were, you know, gatherings, plays. Um, next slide. Uh, you can see Don, this is up in the balcony. And so they kept it as true to the restoration as possible. For the poorer seats, they were just flat benches. No padding, no backs. Um, but uh, so they tried to keep the uh, restoration as accurate as, as possible. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is a Nazarene um, mother house. Uh, it was um, built in 1903. And in non-COVID times, you can tour part of it. The, I guess there are gorgeous stained glass windows and the Gothic architecture, but it's now a retirement home. And so the age of the inhabitants prevented the tour, but we did call and were allowed to go to the garden next door. Um, next slide. Which is uh, Lourdes Park, and it is patterned in part the grotto after Lourdes French, France, I'm sorry, uh, the site of the healing waters um, in the past. So next slide. Uh, it was a lovely perennial garden, well-kept, uh, well-tended, uh, water feature. Next. That's St. Francis. Next. And that was the grotto, the reproduction of the one in uh, France. I think that's about it. Next slide. Oh, okay. So you could also read about, you know, go, go a quarter mile down this road and turn left and go three quarters of a mile and there'll be this site or this happened there. There's a lot of that in the book. And on the way home, we took a little detour and this was built um, as a draft horse barn in uh, about the early 1900s. And they pointed out that what was unique were those eight limestone arches 
that covered part of the um, interior of the barn. Um, so, so the book is full of, of little things like that. If you like just, you know, dinking around and seeing what does this house look like or what does that farm look like, then, um, you know, it's a great thing to follow. Um, and as I say, we only stayed two nights and we had a full day in Concordia. Um, and so this is kind of the end of, um, of this section. I will say the other couple we went with has been out further west and they got themselves a limestone post from the Post and Rock area and brought it home. It weighed 300 pounds in their pickup and put it in their front yard. Um, they also, on their way to Colorado, arranged to tour a bison ranch and they had pre-ordered um, bison tenderloin and had that on their vacation out in Colorado. So, you know, there's just an amazing array of little things that, you know, you can see and do and, and look at. So I think this concludes this part. Maybe there's some questions. I don't know. Yeah, if, uh, if anyone has a question, uh, unmute yourself and then please mute yourself after you're done asking. Uh, and I'll, in the process, start getting the, the other PowerPoint up and running. This is Jim Williams. I have a quick question. I missed the very first part of this. Linda, did you have any personal connection to Concordia? Uh, no, we just picked a, a part of the state where we hadn't been okay. and used that book to um, identify what we wanted to see. Okay, thank you. Very beautiful okay. slides you showed. My goodness, those are, that's be I'm going to go there. Um, we, we, it, yeah, we, we thought we'd try the very Southeast maybe yeah. this spring sometime. Um, anyway, Helen, you had a question. Uh, well, I just want you to show us the book that you're talking about again, Linda. Okay. Just, uh, give me a second. You can buy well, them at, uh, well, Linda, Sampler. Yeah. Well, while Linda's doing that, I have both of those books and they are outstanding. If you like to get around Kansas, she's gone everywhere. I mean, there's hardly a place. And she always likes to have people uh, comment if they find a place that she's never been to, to send her something, probably to an add to another book or whatever. But it's been really good. It's a good book. Um, I can, can, can you read this or not, Helen? Or... Stop the share long enough to. I don't know if that's a little bigger for people to see or not. Yeah, the Kansas Guidebook. And and this one came out about two years ago, and this is the second edition. And she spent years researching it. Now we did find that in Clay Center, one of the restaurants was closed that sounded really interesting, and um, there was an old car parts store that. Don and the other guy we're looking forward to seeing, but that was closed. So, you know, you have to realize that two years, it's some of the things are out of date. What was really fascinating is your, uh, the photo of the, the sculpture of the orphan uh, train kids. And you said there are 20 of those around Concordia? Around Concordia, right. And, and some of them are, as I say, are donated by the descendants, which I find just very interesting that they invested that much, you know, went back and, and these kids have, as you, if you've read some of the books, you know, good stories and bad stories, I guess generally they're kind of restless, you know, because of the disruption in their life um, kind of thing. But um, is that that's enough, good enough, whoever asked. Cal yeah, Helen? that was me, Jonathan. Okay. I, okay. I just think it'd be worth going to Concordia just to see those sculptures. Yeah, I mean, it was a great town to pick. I mean, we, you know, different interesting things. And anyway. Yeah, we killed the day there pretty easy. Yeah. Um, so this has nothing to do with Sweden. Jonathan just said it didn't have to be in, in this country. So I just picked two places that you know, I had some slides on or, or whatever. Um, we were on a Rhodes Scholar trip that put us four nights in Copenhagen and four nights in Stockholm. 
Um, and at the end of that, as the introduction said, we spent a week pursuing my genealogy, uh, my Swedish genealogy. So uh, I'll start with a few slides of the tourist attractions in Stockholm and then talk more about the genealogy and, and that kind of thing. Um, next slide. So Stockholm is a gorgeous city um, on 14 different islands surrounded by water. I mean, they're just gorgeous views almost in any direction. Um, the picture on the right is the Grand Hotel, which is famous for its uh, smorgasbord. Um, across the picture on the left, across the way there is the old town, uh, which dates back to 1250. Um, next slide. So this, this is the old town, uh, the, slide, the picture on the left, people are walking up the narrow cobblestone ways into the old town. Um, the middle picture is a central plaza. And I don't think I chose the right one because we had a picture of a Burger King in that plaza <laughs> of all things. Um, but the buildings, date back to uh, medieval times. And there is our guide on the right showing us how they protected the corners of the building um, with that cannon uh, at the edge there uh, to protect that. Um, next slide. So I think we probably did have some reindeer at some point in time. We had a um, wild soup or a wild uh, kind of, and we think it had some reindeer uh, in it. And uh, now the old town is full of um, tourist places and restaurants and uh, shops, but there's still the, the architecture I thought was just really interesting. Um, next slide. So the, the buildings, you know, there was gorgeous colors. And um, the picture on the left, if I, it's hard to see, maybe that's a little small, but the joints between the floors of the buildings were quite unique sometimes. And the simpler ones meant the building was older. So those look a little fancier, so they might be somewhat, uh, somewhat newer. Um, we all had earphones, so our guide was talking to us, and then we could hear her without any trouble. And then the left picture is a close-up of that flower thing up above in the middle picture. I mean, they just took every chance to plant some plants and have some color and flowers and, and um, everything, even though you didn't have trees on the street or uh, some of that. Next slide. Uh, this is the Vasa Museum. And um, the Vasa was a ship uh, built under the direction of the king. And its maiden voyage was in 1628. And 20 minutes later, it was at the bottom of the ocean because the king had ordered that they build another deck on the top. And this whole thing was top heavy and it set sail and sunk. Um, Plus it was loaded with cannons and ammunition and all kinds of things and kind of over, overweight. Overweight and, and the weight was not distributed right. This, this is a huge, let's see, it's about 270 feet long and 144 feet tall. It's, it's all wood, the carving on it is exquisite. Um, look at the cannon portholes and that lion then in the, in the face of that cannon porthole. Uh, the building is entirely temperature and humidity controlled, but our guide still said that it was deteriorating as it sat there because you're just exposed to some of the atmosphere. Uh, one of our people on our on our tour had been there when it 20 years before when it was in a different facility and he said that was old and dank and and really not this was much improved um, 
but still isn't the perfect situation uh, for it. So uh, it, it laid on the bottom of the ocean for like 300 years. And it was 1961 that they made an attempt to raise it and restore it. So that, there were several museums of interest and this, this was just one of them that we went to and had, had a tour uh, of. Um, next slide. Um, this is the city hall and uh, that's on the left and on the right, I'm standing out in front of it and I'm looking across the water at the old town uh, area. And inside the city hall, this is where the Nobel Prize um, ceremony takes place. And so there are several large, uh, large rooms. This is the blue room. And this is where the banquet is. And then the people would walk up those stairs to what's called the gold room. Uh, next slide. And the gold room is composed of 18 million little tiles, all done in pictures of things around uh, Sweden. Um, the main sculpture on the north end there is the Lady of the Lake. And if you could see, that's the middle picture. And she has the town of Stockholm in her lap. And then other symbology around it. It's kind of done in a Byzantine style, uh, but 18 million little pieces of gold and glass. Uh, the whole, you know, walls, floor, ceiling are, are mosaic. So that, that was really an outstanding um, place to visit and interesting to know that the Nobel ceremony took place uh, in that building. Um, I'm not sure what else. Let's try the next one, see where we are. Oh, okay. So if I can get you, my mother's side of the family is the Swedish side. And my grandfather, the two red dots on the map are my grandfather's and the blue dot is my grandmother's sources where they came from. Okay, so the upper red one, the upper red one, uh, this family drove in to Stockholm on the last day of our tour because they wanted to meet us. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so we had, if you will, the three women there are three generations. Uh, the oldest one, uh, Inga, is, was 85. Um, her daughter, Barbro, was um, 59. And their daughter was 25. And they spoke, this family spoke the best uh, English. And uh, the father was an economist. He um, advised the government and he ran a thousand hectare farm. Uh, their daughter just graduated with a five year engineering program um, and was gonna, get, gonna have her first job. So they drove in to meet us. The building we're standing in front of is the apartment of their oldest daughter. And they brought with them food, moose stew. It was uh, wonderful. It was, <laughs> it was unbelievable. I mean, potatoes, salad, cheese. Um, and then we had dessert. And then... A couple hours after sharing photos and we exchanged gifts, I bought little, brought little quilt things to give to people um, as we went. Uh, we had what's called fika, which is a pause in the day when you have some kind of pastry or coffee or sweet. And the grandmother had made the coffee cake with cherry topping from her own uh, cherry trees. So it, 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 we were just overwhelmed with the hospitality. I mean, you, you hear about the Swedish people being reserved and you know, stoic and all of that. And it, what we felt was incredible. As I say, they drove 120 kilometers in to uh, meet us. Um, let me just say quickly that I connected with this family 
I have most of my stuff on ancestry. And there was a, a person who kept appearing in all of the um, people I was researching. And so I finally, through ancestry, wrote to her and said, I am a descendant of this person, and I think you're a descendant of this other person. Um, is this true? And she wrote back and she wrote to these people and because she had been in contact with them for years and they immediately wrote me and said, we want to meet you. Um, my grandfather's family had his, my great grandfather, there were 12 in the family. Okay. So the, this ancestor moved from the Southern red dot in 1877 to cook for railroad workers. And so this family then located where uh, that top red dot is. Um, so the next day we headed out by train and I have to tell you, we made all the reservations online. Uh, we got train tickets printed off, we couldn't read them. Um, we made our hotel reservation. Um, we made the car reservation online. And so when we were on the tour, we asked our tour guides what the train tickets meant. Um, we didn't realize that uh, we, we'd gotten first class tickets. Uh, and no, no, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't that expensive. Not really. Well, it, was, it was the better tickets. You it had was better the seats. Better seats. That was, that was all. Um, but we got breakfast and we didn't know we'd checked off breakfast, but <laughs> we got... <laughs> We end up with breakfast. So um, anyway, this was the first meeting uh, with the family, with a family. And um, let's go on to the next slide. Okay, so we took the train, which is the black line from Stockholm, that curvy thing down to where those little hashed lines are. And we changed trains. So we got on this train that was two cars long. And we felt like we were Hansel and Gretel going through the woods. This little train with two cars wound down this single track for another, what is that? Like 20, 30 minutes. Something 20 like that. or 30 minutes. There were not very many people on the train and the conductor wanted to practice his English. So we, we spoke to him and let him practice um, his English. And we were headed for a town of about 10,000 called Vetlanda which is where um, there was another cousin. So, and that cousin, let's see, the people in Lindsborg really helped. Um, they had found someone in that area to help us. And when I sent him the information, he actually said, I know your relative, you don't need me. I'll turn it over to your relative. So, in Vetlanda, it was actually the relative that helped us there also. Um, next slide. So we stayed at, at what it turned out to be uh, a conference center. And um, it was about six miles out of town. So it was very quiet. Uh, we had was a cafeteria where we could buy, buy breakfast. Uh, and this was our little rental car. And Don will tell you the story about it. Well, we, we got to Vetlanda and I had to take a taxi over to an Avis place. Well, it turns out the Avis is in a car dealership. And I go in, there's a little desk there. It has the Avis sign behind it. And they have to go find the guy who's the Avis rep. And he comes out and he goes, oh, yeah, I got your reservation here. He said, let's go out to the car. So we walk out there and he, we walk around and make sure there's no damage. And he shows me a few things and he hands me the keys. And this is like Thursday. And he goes, well, we'll see you Monday. I'm like, okay. So I get in and I drive off and I realize I never got any paperwork. <laughs> I thought, hopefully we won't get stopped. <laughs> not, but, nothing. But not, you know, it's not like here. It was just kind of informal. It's like, okay, here's the keys. Here's the car. See ya. And uh, off we went. <laughs> and he said, uh, I'll, we'll see you on Monday. And I said, so we got to get back to the train station. How can I do that? And he goes, oh, I'll take you back when you come. I'm like, okay. It was all kind of laid back, pretty informal. And I thought, well, I got the guy's business card. If I get stopped for some reason, I'll just tell him to call him. He's got the paperwork somewhere. <laughs> quite, quite different than any experience here in this country. Yeah. 
we we were not traveling in big cities or um, and we already had all the all the highway maps on our phones. Uh, it really was very easy to get around in this less populated. You know, we weren't in Stockholm or Gothenburg or any of those. So next slide. So there were little units like this um, with about six bedrooms in them. And we were early, we were late May, early June. So this was a little bit off season. And this is what our bedroom looked like. We had a private bath, um, very clean, neat, simple. As I say, we were glad to be out of town and quiet. Uh, there was a Best Western in Vetlanda that we looked at, but it didn't have good reviews. And it turns out there was a music concert Oh. that weekend and so we were glad we were not there we were, it was right on the square where the concert was yeah and so we were glad we had this little uh quiet place kind of looked like an ikea showroom uh, <laughs> okay next slide okay so if you can see on the map um the little hash train line and then there's a line to the coast Okay, so that we took three day trips kind of out of Atlanta. And so the first day we went to the coast, which is where my grandmother's family was from. Um, and this is Mary Ann, and she has the contact for this area from Lindsburg. The people in Lindsburg know her, she's been to Lindsburg, um, she's helped many people. She tried very hard to find a relative, but I had no relatives on my grandmother's side uh, still there. So she um, took us around herself and um, we made a whole day of it. It was, it was unbelievable. Um, next slide. So she provided me with this notebook, all in Swedish, <laughs> but <laughs> helpful. Um, she didn't speak English. And she didn't speak English. So the gal on the right there in the picture is our translator. We had to hire a translator. And her story was remarkable. As a late teens, early 20s, she came to the United States, not as an au pair, but to drive for a lady. Well, she had just gotten her driver's license and this lady lived in L.A. So here she was with a new driver's license from Sweden, driving this lady around in L.A., and uh, she ended up driving this lady to Florida. So, you know, she had, she, she was a lot of fun. Anyway, um, we met at this church and the church, she said was the nicest one, had had many gifts given to it. We were allowed to go inside. And it's where my um, grandmother's parents would have attended for a while. And it was like a 10 kilometer walk to church if they were walking. Um, and it's where the two older children in a family of five would have been baptized. Uh, so it was, you know, where I'm, where I came from, so to speak. Uh, next slide. So you can see the, the inside is really quite lovely and it has some interesting ornate. And most of the time these were gifts um, the list is of all the, all the priests or ministers, and I can't pick it out now, but we did pick out the one that was there when my relatives would have been uh, attending church there. Um, next slide. Next, she took us to a place where the family lived, uh, and you can see it's a woodsy um, it's rocky, it's hilly. That's very typical of this whole area of, uh, of Sweden. The house would have been much smaller. It would have been a tiny place. Um, and uh, next slide. Behind it was a lake. And so it, it honestly, it's one of my favorite landscapes. I mean, rocky, hilly, lakes, forest, it's one of my favorite uh, landscapes. And so this whole part of Sweden is that way. Um, and so after this, out comes baskets from her car 
And we had permission to use the table and chairs and we had morning uh, fika. We had orange juice and coffee and pastries and little napkins with Swedish flag on the napkins. And um, we had our little break for the morning. Um, so uh, next slide. We then went to a museum to look at some carvings and um, you know, I think that this was nothing related to the family, but she did prepare a whole day for us. Um, and then we had lunch at this restaurant on the water. And one of the ways you can conserve money in terms of traveling in, C in Sweden is that their big meal is at noon. And many of the restaurants have, if you will, a fixed price menu. And so it's a buffet usually. Um, you may have a fish choice, some kind of a meatball, um, meatloaf choice, salad, um, well, I think it was 11 or $12. So, you know, it was very reasonable. And, and that counted, um, you know, by the time we had fika and we had this big lunch, we didn't need- And then uh, we had fika in the afternoon. We had fika in the afternoon too, and we didn't need dinner. You know, we really, uh, we really didn't. Um, okay, so after this, we went to a quarry and again, this was just part of our day, but her comment was that many people in the area worked in the quarry bank in the late 1800s. Um, Quite likely the ancestors would have worked there. So that, that's why she took us there. Uh, next slide. So this, this is the quarry, it's no longer in use. There, the color of the um, marble or the granite there is, you can see in the, in the background, but it's no longer in use. But the best thing about it is we had to walk to get there. Uh, next slide. And it was just picturesque. Uh, rock walls, the, the soil is very rocky. It's not good for agriculture. And in many pictures, you'll see a black cat as part of the farm. Uh, next slide. It was just, you know, it's just gorgeous. Little red houses. Next slide. And, and we've read that in this part of Sweden, you ought to just take your rental car and drive the back roads. And it's just one picturesque little scene after the other um, as you drive around. Uh, next slide. Okay, so this is my family that came from the area I have just been talking about. So, I just got this picture this summer from the husband of a second cousin who was kind enough to send me a box of pictures. He had no idea what he had and I finally figured out what this was. It did have some labels on the back. So my grandmother is in the picture on the right in the middle. Um, I think I saw some pictures of her siblings 40 years ago after my grandfather died, but I'd forgotten that she had two brothers. Um, I knew the uh, aunts very well. This picture was taken in Chicago in um, 1895 and they left Sweden in 1893. So the baby was born in Chicago, but the other four children, the parents and the widowed mother-in-law all came in 1893. And I do have um, on their boat from Sweden to England, because they went Sweden to England, trained across England, and then they left from Liverpool or wherever to go to New York. So I have the manifest from the boat listing everybody um, from 1893. The um, I had pictures of the boys when they were older, but I couldn't. I couldn't, they, were, they weren't labeled and I didn't know which brother was which brother. So with this picture, I, I was able to tell that. Um, and so the sequence of what happened, the wife's sister in 1892 left for Chicago and this family came a year later. So the same thing that's happening with our immigrants today, somebody comes, then they bring the rest of the family. Um, so the, the younger daughter and only surviving uh, sibling went a year earlier and then this family followed. 
And in the 1900 census, the two families are living next door to each other. Mm -hmm. So there was quite the Swedish community in Chicago. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, around 1900, um, outside of Stockholm, Sweet, uh, Chicago was the second most um, Swedish number of Swedish people in, in a city outside of Stockholm. Um, okay, so next slide. Okay, so back to the map. The next day we traveled south um, to a town of Vaxwa. I think I'm saying it halfway correctly. And we went there to see another cousin. Um, and we went to the emigrant museum or emigrant house is what this uh, building is. Um, in Lindsberg, the researchers had a database where they had addresses of people and they were able to provide me with a couple of addresses. And so I literally snail mail wrote two or three people I had um, a paragraph in English and then I Google translated it and sent it, said we were coming, you know, could we meet? And that's how this person, that's how I got this person. Um, and he said, come and I'll show you um, the immigrant house here. Uh, this area just to the Southeast is the glass blowing area. Uh, we were too much into the genealogy to do other touristing, so I didn't, didn't get to see there. Anyway, inside the house, the museum, I mean. Next slide. Was this great sign. <laughs> <laughs> of, of where they were headed, you know, they were headed to Linsburg and Chicago and uh, Minnesota, um, in terms of the immigrants. Um, one of the reasons so many ended up in Chicago was that that was the train center uh, distribution from, from Chicago, all directions. The other interesting thing that was uh, described in the museum was that Swedish uh, women were valued as housekeepers. They were good uh, organizing, kept things clean. And so there was a whole system of somebody going and then somebody bringing a friend or younger sister along, finding them a place to stay or a job. And there was a whole system of, of uh, single women going, going to Chicago um, or other places and being helped along the way. And I, I thought that was very, very interesting. What drew them to Lindsborg? Well, there was a settlement in Lindsberg, I think in the 1850s or much earlier, there was someone who settled there. And I assume it was the agricultural land. Um, I, I'm not sure, but um, you know, definitely Southern Sweden is very agricultural. It's, it's flatter. So I, I'm guessing that, but I don't know for sure, Jim. Uh, next slide. So this is the cousin. And we went to hit, well, he took us to lunch, again, a fixed meal kind of thing. And then we went to his house. And so you see his living room. And he, he lived uh, on the fifth floor of a cooperative. And so there were two apartments or two condos on each floor. So there were 10 apartments. Or, and if, do you see all the heavy glass on his uh, coffee table and there on the dining room table? So he had collected quite a bit of the glass from the glass blowing area that was um, right to the southeast of this uh, place. We also had fika that afternoon. So, you know, <laughs> we didn't have to worry about uh, dinner. He had done research in the 1990s. So he handed me a packet of material, also in Swedish, but he also, um, he was very private. I, he wouldn't say what he did. He wouldn't show us pictures of his kids, but yet he invited us into his house and, and showed us around, was happy. I think they were curious about these people who left, what happened to them, you know? And um, mm -hmm. I had pictures of my grandparents and aunts and uncles and things like that to show. Um, but he also, in his research back in the 90s, that was 30 years ago, 
an, a while ago. So told me about the mother of these 12 children, um, that she would walk two or three days to the coast to get herring. And she would sleep overnight in the cemeteries because it was safer. And then brought the herring back for, and I, I need to check it out before I write this up, um, whether it was for food for them or to sell in their markets. So this mother of 12 children was doing that kind of thing to help the family. Uh, he said she also caught crayfish out of streams. And I assume they would eat them, you know, eat, eat those. I mean, these were poor families. Um, the kids had to leave home early because they couldn't uh, feed them all, uh, et cetera. So um, next slide. Okay, so this is the next day and we are on this, on the map, we're on the little red lines. We're going out to the parish where um, these 12 children were born over uh, 25 years, really. And the parish is uh, Bacaby and that's the church. Uh, that is not the church that was there when my family was there. Um, it burned down. It burned down. So, but we did go through the cemetery and look at the graves. Uh, this is the area. The youngest daughter was the one who stayed here and took care of the parents, especially the mother. And so she only married late in life after, and she felt abandoned. The, uh, the previous guy there had written up a, a history and said that all the brothers and sisters would leave. Uh, of the 12, six of them emigrated to North America. Three died and three stayed in Sweden. So she felt kind of abandoned and she was the one who stayed uh, there and took care of the, took care of the mother. Um, next slide. And so these were, the, the girl is actually the cousin, but it's her father that is interested in the genealogy. And he also went back there. They were interested in going back in time. How far back can we go? You know, and, and probably the 1600s are, uh, the records become very difficult to, uh, to interpret then. And I think she was along to help translate. As we went along, there were um, uh, less and less ability with, uh, with English. But he'd done enough research that he found that he and his wife were related. So he told us that he was also related to us because um, he was related to his wife somewhere back uh, in their history. Uh, next slide. Okay, so we had to walk to get there. We had to walk down this gravel road and you can see it's not good farming country. Um, so people did have to leave to support themselves. And the pile of rocks on the right is the foundation of the little house where my great grandfather would have lived part of his life. Hmm. And the historical societies would mark these. So this was marked Carlsjorn um, is the name of the little farm, if you will. So um, that, was, that was quite special. It was quite special to be there. Uh, next slide. And that's what the farmhouse might have looked like, you know, just a little wooden structure with a sod top and um, mm. not too many windows and doors. And the picture on the right is just, it was just a one I snapped when we stopped one time. This is what the uh, landscape looks like uh, today. Yes, they're fields, but I don't know, all those walls down there are rock. So it's like the Ozarks, everything is just rocky soil, rocky soil. And we made one more stop that was kind of a surprise. Um, next slide. And we stopped at this house and this was arranged. This is yet another cousin, <laughs> um, but that was very a very typical, um, that's a very typical Swedish house. They had added this beautiful room on the uh, side there that was all, uh, all glass. And 
The next slide. We had FICA. <laughs> so uh, the couple on the left, uh, he was the cousin. The couple on the right was another cousin, all descendants of that youngest sister who stayed in the area. And this was the farm she married into. And so this is where her descendants have stayed. Um, the gentleman on the um, right is one of the people I did the snail mail thing to. So he had his grandson respond and I couldn't quite figure out how we were gonna all get together, but the, the person that took us on this trip organized it all. And so we were able to meet them. And, you know, we all got hugs when we left. Don got hugs. I mean, it, it just this, this stereotype of the cold uh, stoic was just not what we felt. The hospitality for the whole week was just unbelievable. And, yeah. and those are homemade goodies there on the, on the table. Um, next slide. Oh, I think this is, this is the end, the Swedish flag. Um, it, it truly for me was a trip, uh, trip of a lifetime to, to experience that and to see that and, and, and meet up with so many different people. It, it was really wonderful. Um, everybody was welcoming. There was nobody that made you feel like it was an imposition on their time that we were there and wanted to see them. It's like they all went out of their way to welcome us. And, and again, I think they were curious as, you know, all these people who left, what became of them, you know, what, what happened to them. Um, anyway, questions? Linda and uh, Don, thank you. That was just wonderful. And uh, so clearly explained and so exciting that you have connected with your family so well. Do you anticipate any of them would come here to see you? Um, <clears throat> no, I don't know. Um, that, you know, especially now with COVID. Um, uh -huh. the, the youngest I of mean, the well, if there's ever going to be a post-COVID. Right, yeah. right. The youngest of the 12 um, in my grandfather's family homesteaded in Canada. And if, if we get situation, I would like to go visit her because it was her grandfather that came. It was my great grandfather. So in the youngest and, you know, there's a whole generation there that um, mm -hmm. is different. And, and they're good friends with the first family I showed you. So I, I don't know whether there's a place of interest that they would um, be willing to meet, you know, like, uh, like Florida. Um, two of the families mm -hmm. that were in there had daughters who were au pairs here. So they mm -hmm. had been, they have been they, here. They have been here. But, yeah. Uh, Whether they'd want to come back, you know, they, it's expensive and, um, you know, I, I, I don't know. Thank you. Um, were they interested in what you do for a living, both of you? Um, Mine was harder to explain because they don't have the concept of a community college. Right. You know, I did just the fact that I was in education, taught biology, that kind of thing. Um, Don's was more explainable. <laughs> yeah. Well, in a career in aviation, at least they can relate to that somewhat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Linda, Linda, how long how long did it take you to make all of the contacts with them with your snail mail and so on? Um, you know, I attended that workshop in Lindsburg in um, 2017. Oh, okay, yeah. And we we went in the spring of 2019. Okay, but, but it was really I would say the six months or so before we went. Was, was when I really, you know, I had to go to Lindsberg to get their help. And, um, you know, they were finding contacts. And then when I snail mailed these people and got responses from two out of the three, I was just amazed. Uh, you know, it was, it was fun. That's wonderful. Um, hey, Linda, 
Yes. Did your relative show any interest in American culture, politics, anything American? Um, they, they were curious about uh, my pictures of the relatives, whether they wanted to see if they looked what they looked like or what they did. They asked a little bit about what they did. My grandfather, um, you know, kind of kind of thing. Um, come, some of them, we didn't have enough English to to do much conversing. After, uh, after the first folks in Stockholm, it kind of went downhill a little bit as far as the quality of their English. Um, but we were able to at least figure some of it out. Right, right. Um, I don't know. I you're, We were more learning about the history there than, and we just spent really a few hours with each of these people, you know, a couple hours. So it wasn't like an in-depth um, uh, situation. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You know, I myself have Swedish background and I've never heard of Fika. And apparently it's a, it, I was just looking it up. It's, it's a big deal. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Oh yes. <laughs> you, you, you take a break. About it, three times a day. No, or two at least. At least two. And then some of them have it at night. Yeah. So their big meal is during the day. So, you know, every place we went through on three trips or three visits, we had fika once or twice, and then we had a big meal at lunch. So we were doing granola bars at night. I mean, we were, you know. Uh, we ate well. Any, anything else? Questions? I, if you, any of you have Swedish ancestry that you're interested in, um, the, is, the people in Lindsberg are offering a Zoom instruction on um, using the Swedish church books. And, and that's the best way to at least begin to delve into your ancestors. And I think it's January 9th and it's like a nine to four sessions. And, wow. and after I went, uh, Libby went, Libby and her husband went. Um, and I think Pat Jonason went too. And she was there when we were there. Okay, okay. And it, I mean, it, if you want to do something, that's the way kind of to get into it. Um. Thank you so much. This was great. Yes, yes it was. Thanks. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank glad, you. You all, glad you all came. If you, uh, if you missed the first few minutes of this, uh, it will be posted on YouTube. And uh, so you'll be able to catch up on those first few minutes. And in addition, our next one is on uh, January 25th. And it's uh, Libby and Mark are doing uh, 10 national parks in 10 days. Libby, that's more. <laughs> you must have been tired. <laughs> and, then, and then I just told Jonathan, I think we'll add what we did this fall too, which was to go to the uh, Great Smoky Mountain National Park and the Blue Ridge Parkway and uh, we saw North Carolina in uh, in all its glory in the fall. So, oh wow, North Carolina, <laughs> how fun! That was also a ten day trip, and we were very tired. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Linda. Thank okay, you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. bye. bye.